Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Priti Matthews and I'll be talking about Central Venous Access and the CVP Monitoring. Central Venous Cannulation is an essential technique for both long-term and emergent medical care which allows rapid high volume fluid resuscitation, administration of concentrated ionic solutions and the hemodynamic measurements. The superior vena cava is assessed through the internal jugular veins, subclavian veins and less commonly through external jugular veins. The inferior vena cava is assessed through the femoral veins. The external jugular vein also provides route to central circulation but it is technically a peripheral site. The main indications for central venous access are inability to obtain peripheral access for procedures like pulmonary artery catheter placement, transvenous pacemaker placement or urgent hemodialysis, for measurement of central venous pressures in case of sepsis, congestive heart failure and pericardial effusion, and also for administration of sclerosing medications, continuous vasopressors, concentric ionic solutions or cytotoxic chemotherapeutic agents. Now we will be dealing with the equipments used for the central line insertion. First and foremost we require the sterile personal protective gears like the gloves, gown, mask and the hair cover, sterile drape and towels, sterile preparation solutions, 10 ml syringes containing sterile normal saline flush and the main thing is the central venous catheter set which contains 1% lidocaine with small gauge needle and syringe. 18 gauge introducer needle, guide wear, 11 blade scalpel, the veno dilator, single or multi lumen catheter, 4 gauze pads, 30 or 40 silk suture with straight needle or with needle driver, and the sterile transparent dressing. Coming to the patient preparation, Explain the procedure, its risk and its benefits to the patient or their representatives and obtain an informed consent unless performed emergently. Positioning In case of internal jugular vein, Trendelberg position is used and slight head rotation towards opposite side of cannulation is preferred. In case of subclavian vein, Trendelberg position is not necessary. Slightly abduct the patient's arm on side that is to be cannulated. In case of femoral vein, supine or reverse Trendelberg position is usually used. Identify the vessel either based on USG guidance or anatomic landmarks and then prepare the parts. It is recommended to prepare entire neck and clavicular area in case of IGV or subclavian roots. Apply electrocardiographic monitoring, pulse oximetry, non-invasive blood pressure monitoring and administer supplemental O2 if required. Commonly used technique for the central line insertion is the Seldinger technique and according to the technique, the clinician wears the gown in the sterile fashion. He wears the mask and the hair covering. Then identify the vessel, preferably under the USG guidance. Then prepare and drape the patient using the standard sterile procedure. Prepare a wider area so an alternate site can be used if the initial attempts fail. Prepare the entire ipsilateral neck and the upper chest when preparing to insert an internal jugular or subclavian catheter. Then open the central catheter kit and inspect the contents in the sterile fashion. Place the kit close to the bedside and the operator. Maintain the sterile conditions. Anesthetize the area in all conscious patients using 1-2% to lidocaine and anesthetize the periosteum of the clavicle if using the subclavian approach. Hold the 18 gauge introducer needle on a 10 ml syringe in the dominant hand and align the needle to the target. Advance the needle slowly through the skin and the subcutaneous tissue until a flash of dark venous blood appears. Stabilize the needle with the non-dominant hand. Check for the continuous free venous flow with the aspiration. If no flow is noted, withdraw the needle slightly as the needle may have breached the posterior vessel wall. Remove the syringe attached to the needle and immediately occlude the catheter with the finger. This manual helps to prevent introducing air in the catheter and subsequent central system air embolism. Then insert the guide wire gently through the needle 
always maintain a firm grip on the wire do not let go of the wire for any reason the wire should advance with minimal resistance do not force the wire for any reason if the wire does not pass easily reattach the syringe and aspirate to confirm continued venous flow and then reposition the needle as needed premature ventricular contractions or dysrhythmias during the wire advancement may indicate that the wire is in the right atrium or beyond remove the needle over the wire when the guide wire is inserted at least 10 cm into the vessel incise the skin with a leven blade at entry side to accommodate the veno dilator advance the dilator over the guide wire into the vessel lumen with a gentle twisting motion remove the dilator and advance the catheter over the wire until wire is advanced through the distal port grab the end of the guide wire and advance the catheter to appropriate depth remove the guide wire and aspirate and flush all the ports to confirm the function secure catheter with suture and apply a sterile transparent dressing and then confirm the catheter placement in superior vena cava with a chest x-ray a catheter tip in the right atrium can perforate the right atrium and cause hemothorax or hemomediastinum with pericardial tamponade This is the diagrammatic representation of the central line insertion. Initially, we place the needle, then we insert the guide wire, and then the needle is removed. Once the needle is removed, we thread the catheter on the guide wire, and then the guide wire is removed and the catheter is in situ. Now we will be dealing about the central line insertion into the internal jugular vein. Internal jugular vein is the direct continuation of sigmoid sinus. and it exits the skull through the jugular foramen just anterior medial to the mastoid process internal jugular vein lies lateral to the internal carotid artery inside the carotid sheath it joins the subclavian vein to form the brachiocephalic vein it has superior and inferior bulbs and the inferior bulb has a bicuspid valve to prevent the retrograde flow The internal jugular vein increases in diameter as it descends and it makes it easier to cannulate below the level of cricoid cartilage. The preferred choice for the axis is the right IJV. In this picture we can see that the internal jugular vein is lying lateral to the internal carotid artery then it joins the subclavian vein and then forms the brachiocephalic vein. Internal jugular vein is collapsible and its diameter is dependent on the intravascular volume status and the patient position. It is easily compressible and will collapse with gentle external pressure from a palpating finger or local masses. It is distensible and on placing patient in Trendelberg position or performing Valsalva manoeuvres it distends the vein. The position of the IJV in relation to the carotid artery within the carotid sheath can vary considerably between the individuals. IJV lies in proximity to the carotid artery, vagus nerve, phrenic nerve, brachial plexus, the thyroid gland and the pleura, placing them at risk for injury during the cannulation. There are mainly three approaches to the internal jugular vein, the central, anterior and the posterior approaches. coming to the central approach the landmark for the central approach is the superior apex of the triangle which is formed by the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the clavicle the angle with the skin is 30 degrees in child and 45 to 60 degrees in adult and it is aimed to ipsilateral nipple and the internal jugular vein lies with a depth of 3 cm coming to the anterior approach The landmark is the medial edge of the sternocleidomastoid muscle at the level of the thyroid cartilage. The angle with the skin is same, 30 degree in child and 45 degree in adult, and it is also aimed towards the ipsilateral nipple. And the internal jugular vein lies in a depth within 3 cm. Coming to the posterior approach, the landmark is the lateral edge of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. at one third of the way from the clavicle to the mastoid process the angle with the skin is 30 to 45 degree and we have to dive under the border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and aim towards the sternal notch here the internal jugular vein lies within a depth of 5 cm
These are the diagrammatic representation of the various approaches. As mentioned earlier, first we'll be dealing about the central approach. And in the central approach, patient will be placed in the Trendelberg position with head slightly tilted to the contralateral side. And the landmark for the central approach, as said earlier, is the triangle created by the clavicle and the sternal and the clavicular hips of the sternocleidomastoid. Now, the internal jugular vein will be lying just deep to this triangle and the needle will be inserted at a 30 to 45 degree angle to the skin, one centimeter below the apex of the triangle, parallel to the carotid artery. And it will be directed towards the ipsilateral nipple. Successful venous return typically occurs within one to three centimeter of the needle advancement. Then coming to the anterior approach, identify the pulse and the course of the carotid artery, which lies medially, and then hold the carotid artery with fingers of non-dominant hand. Hold the needle and the syringe in the dominant hand at an angle of 30 to 45 degree and enter at the midpoint of the medial aspect of the sternal portion of the sternocleidomastoid. The needle will be directed towards the ipsilateral nipple and successful venous return typically occurs within 3 to 5 cm of the needle advancement. And in posterior approach, the landmark is the lateral aspect of the clavicular portion of the sternocleidomastoid, one third of the distance from the clavicle to the mastoid process. Direct the needle towards the sternal node and the successful venous return typically occurs within 3 to 5 cm of the needle advancement. Coming to the UST guided approach, place the probe on the sternocleidomastoid and then identify the thyroid gland, carotid artery and the internal jugular vein. The contraindication to the central line insertion into the internal jugular vein are anatomic distortion of the neck, actual or the suspected cervical spine fractures and any penetrating neck injuries, implanted pacemakers or defibrillator, non-severe carotid artery stenosis or atherosclerosis, ongoing or impending thrombolytic therapy and left bundle branch block. Coming to central venous insertion through the subclavian vein, subclavian vein begins as continuation of axillary vein at the lateral edge of the first rib. It causes anterior to the anterior scalene muscles which separate it from the subclavian artery. It then descends to join the IJV and forms the brachiocephalic vein. The domes of the pleura lie posterior and inferior to the subclavian veins. Fibrous connective tissue joins subclavian veins to the clavicle, preventing its collapse even in the event of low flow state. The right subclavian vein is preferred to left for venous access because the thoracic duct joins the left subclavian vein at its junction with left IJV. There are two approaches to the subclavian vein cannulation, the infraclavicular approach and the supraclavicular approach. The infraclavicular approach, the entry site is just inferior to the clavicle at the mid-clavicular line. The needle orientation is kept as close to the coronal plane as possible and its aim is towards just posterior to the sternal notch. And the depth of the subclavian vein from the skin is 3 to 4 cm. In supraclavicular approach, the entry site is 1 cm lateral to the clavicular head of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and 1 cm posterior to the clavicle. The needle is oriented at 10 degrees anterior to the coronal plane medially. It is directed towards the contralateral nipple, needle bisects angle formed by the clavicle and the clavicular head of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The depth of the supraclavicular vein from the skin is 2 to 3 centimeters here. This is the diagrammatic representation of the infraclavicular approach where the needle is just inferior to the clavicular at the mid-clavicular line. This is the diagrammatic representation of the supraclavicular approach where the needle entry site is 1 cm lateral to the clavicular head of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and 1 cm posterior to the clavicle which is aimed towards the contralateral nipple. In UST guided approach, supraclavicular approach allows good sonographic visualization of the proximal subclavian vein while infraclavicular approach is limited due to the large acoustic shadow created by the clavicle.
The main contraindication to the center line insertion to the subclavian vein are current or imminent thrombolysis, any coagulopathies, chest wall deformities and distorted anatomy, any suspicious of vascular injury to the chest or the ipsilateral upper extremity, prior surgery or trauma to the clavicle or to the first two ribs or the subclavian vessels, any implanted pacemaker or defibrillator and relying on a single lung. Now coming to the central line insertion through the femoral vein. Femoral vein is the continuation of popliteal vein. It lies within the femoral sheath and just medial to the femoral artery in the groin. The contents of the femoral sheath from medial to the lateral are the nerve, artery, vein and the lymphatics. Femoral vein lies approximately 1 cm medial to the femoral artery, pulse in adults and about 0.5 cm medial in infants and young children. Femoral artery lies at the mid inguinal point. This diagram shows the contents of the femoral sheath. From the lateral to the medial, we have the femoral nerve, femoral artery and the femoral vein. Now coming to the approach to the femoral vein, the entry site is 2 to 4 cm inferior to the midpoint of the inguinal ligament and 1 cm medial to the femoral artery pulse with needle directed at 45 to 60 degree angle to the skin and parallel to the long axis of thigh. Performing femoral venous cannulation 1 to 2 cm inferior to the inguinal ligament is to prevent inadvertent intra-abdominal extra-iliac vein rupture which is a leading to potentially large and invisible hematoma into the retroperitoneal space. For USC guided approach, place the probe in a transverse position just below the mid portion of the inguinal ligament and then we will be able to visualize the femoral vein and the femoral artery. Coming to the contraindications of central line insertion to the femoral vein, the main complications are infection, it can also cause venous thrombosis, significant trauma to the ipsilateral lower extremity of the groin area and abdominal trauma. To the complications of central venous catheterization, it can cause pneumothorax, it can cause the puncture to the adjacent arteries, malpositioning, it can cause the catheter associated infection which is more in the femoral axis and less in the subclavian axis, it can cause thrombosis which is more in the femoral axis. It can cause chylothorax as the thoracic duct lies in proximity to the subclavian vein. It can cause hydrothorax or hydromediastinum, air emboli, great vessel or the right atrial perforation and the airway compromise. Next, we'll be dealing with the central venous pressure. It is the pressure measured in the central veins. It's the mean right atrial pressure and the normal CVP ranges from 5 to 10 centimeters of water or 2 to 6 mm Hg. Its contributors to the central venous pressure are the central venous blood volume which depends on the venous return cardiac output and the total blood volume. The second is the compliance of the central compartment that deals with the vascular tone, right ventricular compliance, myocardial disease and any pericardial disease. Then it also contributed by tamponade, that is any tricuspid valve disease, stenosis or regurgitation. Any dysrhythmias present in the patient also contributes to the central venous pressure values, that is the junctional rhythm, any AF or atrioventricular dissociations. The positioning of the patient also contributes to the CVP values. The intrathoracic pressure changes such as the respiratory changes, the intermittent positive pressure ventilation, positive end expiratory pressure and in case of tension pneumothorax also the CVP may alter. CVP is found to be elevated in conditions of hover hydration which increases the venous return heart failure or the pulmonary artery stenosis which limit the venous outflow and leads to the venous congestion, positive pressure breathing and straining. CVP is found to be decreased in cases of hypovolemic shock, dehydration and negative pressure breathing. 
Methods of the monitoring, there is non-invasive measurement and invasive measurement. In non-invasive measurement, we look for the jugular venous pulsations and under USG guidance. In invasive measurement, we have manometer system and the transducer system. The transducer system enables continuous reading and which are more accurate. To the jugular venous pulsations method, jugular venous pulsations can estimate the right atrial pressures. The sternal angle lies 5 cm above the right atria. With the patient sitting at 45 degree angle, add 5 cm to the vertical distance between the jugular pulsations and the sternal angle to estimate the CVP in centimeters of water. Under the USG guidance, examine the right jugular vein using high-frequency linear transducer. Look for the site where the vein tapers. Measure the vertical distance in centimeter between point of collapse and the sternal angle and then add 5 cm to obtain the CVP in centimeters of water. A distended JVP indicates CVP more than 10 cm. Central venous pressure can be measured also using the IVC. An IVC that is small and measures less than 2 cm in diameter and has 50% collapsibility with inspiration correlates to the central venous pressure that is less than 10 cm. To the invasive method of CVP measurement, it is done using a fluid filled catheter inserted in IJV or the subclavian. The catheter's distal tip sits in the superior vena cava. Connect the catheter to a manometer or transducer of monitor for CVP waveform monitoring. In the CVP waveform, we can see that the C wave represents bulging of the tricuspid valve into the right atrium and occurs at the onset of systole. The base of the C wave determines a CVP value because it is the final pressure in the ventricle before the onset of contraction, reflecting the preload. With this, we come to the end of our session on the central venous axis and the CVP monitoring. Thank you, everyone.